This is the fifth video in the series Linear Algebra for Machine Learning. Last time we talked about systems of linear equations, matrices and different types of matrices. I strongly recommend watching previous videos for a complete understanding of the topics that we will be discussing today. Remember that we represented a system of linear equations with ax equals y where a is the matrix of the coefficients of these equations, x is the vector of the variables and y is the resultant vector. Another way to look at our system of linear equations ax equals y is to think that the matrix A is acting as a transformation on the vector x and resulting in another vector y. This is similar to vector scaling and rotation that I presented in the vector geometry video. This time however, instead of scalar value alpha, we have matrix A. Now in this video, let's build some intuition about matrix as a transformation on a vector and understand these results from a geometric perspective to understand the rotational, translational and scaling properties of a matrix. Let us begin with the identity matrix. We are interested in the product ix equals y, where i is an identity matrix. Expressing it in verbose form for let's say two dimensions helps to understand what happens. Notice we got x equals y. This essentially means that multiplying by an identity matrix preserves the original vector. Let's see a few examples. We have the identity matrix A, so let's represent the first row as vector A0, the second row as A1 and plot them on the xy coordinate axis. If we have a vector x with elements 1 and 1, we can solve y equals ax. To get y equals 1, 1 which is essentially the same as the vector x. Can you guess why now that we have x equals 1 and 2? Correct, y equals 1, 2. If x contains the elements minus 2 and 1, the result is minus 2, 1. So the bottom line is that if you multiply a vector by an identity matrix, the resultant matrix is the same as the original vector, which is also why such a matrix is known as the identity matrix. What about multiplication by a scaled identity matrix, say alpha i? It is easy to note that y equals alpha x in such cases. Let alpha equals 3. As a result, matrix A will have these elements. Let's plot them and can you guess the elements of the resultant matrix? Correct. 3, 3. You can verify by multiplying a and x as before. Here are couple more examples. Now, what about multiplying a general vector x by a general diagonal matrix? Again, easy to work out the math to note that each element of the resulting vector will be scaled by the corresponding factor in the diagonal matrix. Let's see a few more examples. Notice that each element of y is scaled by the corresponding factor in the diagonal matrix. Also, when one diagonal is larger than the other, then y is pulled towards that diagonal. 
So important to learn from these examples is that multiplication with a diagonal matrix transforms the input vector. This may seem like a trivial transform, but it is a handy tool in implementing computationally efficient code. You would be surprised by the number of for loops that can be avoided by simple diagonal matrix multiplication. Now, instead of checking the impact of a matrix on a single vector, wouldn't it be cool to check out the overall impact of a matrix on an entire collection of vectors, rather the entire space? We have already seen that the collection of all possible two-dimensional vectors represent the infinite flat sheet of the two-dimensional space itself. We will use this number plane to represent the 2D space. For better visualization, I'll add a few dots too. Each dot represents the endpoint of a vector in this space. The size of the dot is indicative of the magnitude of the vector it represents. So we will be representing the rows of the matrix on the coordinate axis. Remember A0 is the first row and A1 is the second row vector of the matrix A. You can see the effect of the transformation by the matrix A on this two dimensional input, input space X if you compare the dots in the input and the output space. For this frame you can see that an identity matrix is applied on the input space and therefore there is no effect on the output space since multiplication by an identity matrix returns the same exact input space. Let's start by demonstrating the effect of a diagonal matrix. We have diagonal matrix A. Note how the vector A0 has stretched along the x-axis. Now notice the effect on the output space. The output space also stretches along the x-axis by the same amount. Notice that the relative ordering of the points remains the same, implying a linear transform. Let's reset our output space and try with another diagonal matrix. This time A1 shrinks to 0.8 and A0 stays at 1. Now notice the output space shrinks by the same amount along the y-axis. In addition, I kept a copy of the input space in the background of the output space. So you can also compare the background plane with the foreground plane to understand how the input space has transformed after applying the matrix A. We just saw that changing the diagonal elements stretches or shrinks the space along the corresponding axis. There is no effect on the spacing of the dots along the other axis. Let's see a couple more examples. Note that negating the values along a diagonal has the same effect of flipping the axis and space. Now that we know that diagonal matrices stretch and shrink the space, let's try to understand the impact of orthogonal matrices on the space. Many of the important matrix factorizations and decompositions deal with orthogonal matrices. So it is important to understand the implications of orthogonal transformations. Remember that the angle between orthogonal vectors A0 and A1 in our case must be 90 degrees. Check out how an orthogonal matrix only rotates the input space. And it rotates the input space by the same amount as the matrix is rotated. Also note that there is absolutely no stretching or shrinking due to an orthogonal matrix.
Next up is symmetric matrices. Remember that a symmetric matrix is one with the exact same entries on either side of the main diagonal. So in a way, the second element of A0 and the first element of A1 are exact same. These are a very important family of matrices that appear very often in machine learning literature. We know what influence diagonal and orthogonal matrices have on an input space. A symmetric matrix could sometimes be diagonal or orthogonal, so we already know what to expect in those situations. Let's apply matrix A. Keep a watch on the green dots. These points rotate along the vector A0. Along notice the blue dots. These always align with the second row vector that is A1. It is almost like the first row vector is setting the direction or rotation of the space and then the second dependent vector is acting as a diagonal matrix along that orientation. Notice this in the upcoming examples. Also note that when the two row vectors are aligned along the same plane, the space is squashed into a single dimension. So all points fall into a line and the line is along the same direction as the direction of the first row. Now let's understand the impact of upper triangular matrices on space. Remember that the upper triangular matrices are zero below the main diagonal. I have also simplified the setup now. We have the basis vectors and the input space. Let's visualize the transformation You can notice the copy of the input space in the background. I hope this setup is more clean for the type of matrices that we will be discussing now on. Let's see a few more examples of upper triangular matrices transforming the space. Observe how the space rotates along the y-axis due to the multiplication by an upper triangular matrix. There is no rotation along the x-axis. This is because the y-axis does not participate in the transformation. Of course, except for the stretching, shrinking, flipping along the y-axis. Now lower triangular matrices. Lower triangular matrices are zero above the main diagonal. I'm sure you know what to expect in this case. Observe how the space rotates along the x-axis due to the multiplication by a lower triangular matrix. As expected, there is no rotation along the y-axis. The reason is same as before. The x-axis does not participate in the transformation. Of course, except for the stretching, shrinking and flipping along the x-axis. Now the last one, positive definite matrix. 
Being a symmetric matrix, much of what you saw in the symmetric matrix transform will hold here, with one big difference. The positive definite matrix never turns the space more than 90 degrees. Pay attention to the yellow points or pick your favorite color. See how constrained they are in the transformed space. The angle between each vector x and the original space and the output of the transform Ax is always less than 90 degrees. Thus each point is constrained to an imaginary orthant around it. This is almost equivalent to multiplying by a positive number. That is one intuition behind positive definite. Can you think about what will happen if the matrix were negative definite? Comment down your answers. Now that we understand the geometry of matrix multiplication, it is time to understand its counterpart, the matrix inverse. The inverse of a matrix A is a matrix such that A times A inverse is equals A inverse times A equals identity matrix. We saw earlier that systems of linear equations can be represented in a concise form as Ax equals y where A is the matrix of coefficients, x is the vector of variables that need to be solved for and y is the vector of outputs. And as defined above, A inverse times A equals i. Therefore we can solve these to get x equals A inverse y. This is the solution to our equations in the variables x. In other words, multiplication with a matrix inverse reverts the effect of the original matrix multiplication and recovers the original input vector, the desired solution. Moreover, given the requirements of the matrix multiplication, the A inverse is also a square matrix of the same size as of the original matrix A. Do all matrices have an inverse? What do you think? Now we know from our earlier discussion on systems of linear equations that Ax equals y has a solution if and only if A is full rank. So for A to be invertible or for the inverse to exist, it needs to be square and full rank. No inverse, no solution. No solution, no inverse. Easy as that. A matrix inverse is only defined for a square full rank matrix. Also, we can use plain old Gaussian elimination to find the inverse of a matrix. Same old row multiplication, subtraction, variable elimination. Let's build some intuition from the geometric perspective. Note when the row vectors of A are stretched, the row vectors of A inverse get shrunk. This is much like a reciprocal in arithmetic. Also, when the row vectors of A overlap, that is vectors are not linearly independent, it is no longer full rank and the inverse does not exist. To build further intuition, let's check out the effects of matrix inverse on a plane. Let's transform the space first using A and then apply matrix A inverse to recover the space.
Notice how the inverse of the matrix rotates the space in a direction opposite that by the input matrix. Also notice that when the matrix stretches the space along a direction, its inverse shrinks it along the same direction. The effect is reversed when the matrix shrinks it. Thus, the net effect of A inverse times A times X is the recovery of the original space X. Cool, isn't it? The inverse of an orthogonal matrix is particularly interesting. Let Q is an orthogonal matrix. Remember that the rows and columns of an orthogonal matrix are orthonormal vectors. So a dot product of a row vector with itself is 1. The dot product between any pair of mutually orthogonal vectors is 0. We know that Q times Q inverse equals I must be true for an orthogonal matrix. Now in Q times Q inverse we take the dot product of rows of Q with the columns of Q inverse. The result Q times Q inverse equals I implies that the ith row of Q is same as the ith column of Q inverse. Moreover, if you extend this analysis to higher dimensions, the ith row is orthogonal to the rest of the columns too. This would be possible if Q inverse is equals to Q transpose. Thus the transpose of an orthogonal matrix is its inverse. And because a matrix always has a transpose, an orthogonal matrix is always invertible and never singular. This is a key result. It makes it desirable to factorize or decompose a matrix such that some components are orthogonal matrices. We will study two such decompositions called Eigen decomposition and singular value decomposition soon. We will see the applications of these concepts in machine learning in later videos. So stay tuned. Thanks for your time. Have a nice day.